Welcome to Culture and Causation. This is Aaron Briley. Today is a very special show because I have no guests. Um, I just wanted to make a quick video giving you my thoughts on what's called the Black Contract with America. Now, I first heard about this from Ice Cube. <laughs> yes, that Ice Cube, the, the rapper and actor. When he was going on, he was doing a media tour for about a week up until election day, um, talking to the hosts about his proposal to help improve black inner cities. And it's called the Black Contract with America. Now he didn't specify really what was in the plan. He, he actually didn't talk about it much at all. Most of his interviews consisted of him defending himself, uh, talking with the Trump administration uh, as opposed to the Biden administration. So I went online and looked at it for myself and I wanna give you a quick overview of what it is and I'll tell you what I think about it. So if you go to their website, and their website is actually, it's called contractwithblackamerica.us. You'll find um, a full proposal. It's a pretty comprehensive proposal. It's laid out with 10 different items on there that they want to improve. Um, so it's pretty comprehensive, but I want to just read you the preface. Actually, I want to read you the first sentence of the preface uh, because I think that'll give you a flavor of what they're up to, and you'll know very quickly whether or not this has any real chance of working. So let me read the first sentence. So this is the preface. This quote, this contract with Black America strikes at the heart of racism and presents a blueprint to achieve racial economic justice, unquote. So right off the bat, I get very nervous and um, I just get very nervous when I hear someone talking about racism in this way, as if it's a serious threat to blacks or to minority in 2020. And this, uh, you know, this proposal talks about striking at the heart of racism as if, once again, as if it's this pervasive, you know, oppressive force that's preventing social and economic mobility of blacks and, uh, and other minorities. I mean, this is preposterous. It's 2020, okay? I, I mean, it's, it's really hard to understand how anyone could really think this. So I, I also think when I read something like this that the author of this contract with Black America or maybe even Ice Cube, either of them or both are deeply intellectually dishonest. I mean, that there's racism holding us down. This is one of the main items that you wanna focus on. When we've had a black president, we have blacks in the highest offices, both in the private and public sector in the land. You have black entertainers and athletes. We have millionaires and billionaires who are, who are black, not to mention other minorities. Um, it's so absurd that someone can say now that Blacks are being held down in any great, in any great measure, by this oppressive, stultifying force of racism. It's hard to take them seriously. It it just really is. So that's the first part of this preface. So that that'll give you a taste of where they're coming from. They think this is some major dragon that needs to be slayed in 2020. Um, the other part of this, you know, of the first sentence of the preface says that. They want to present a blueprint to achieve racial economic justice. Now, once again, my spidey sense tingles when I hear the term racial economic justice, because all that really means is just redistributing wealth from people who earned it to people who don't, who haven't earned it. And anytime you start doing that, that makes me not only nervous, but I get you know, deeply upset and um, because it's immoral and it's unjust. Um, how do you justify taking something that someone's earned? And I don't just mean money. I mean, it could be if they earned a place at a company, if they earned a spot uh, at a school because they've worked hard for it. And now someone's going to come and deprive people who have, who have worked hard and achieved these these great 
these great outcomes, only to have them stolen from them and given to and given to someone else. So, yeah, the idea of achieving racial economic justice really just means achieving racially economic equal outcomes. And uh, this is something I find deeply problematic. So that's the first sentence of the preface. So it gives you an idea of what to expect. But now let's, um, let's dig a bit deeper. So I'll talk now just about three different components of the Black Contract with America. I just want to briefly tell you three different components. Like I said, it's made of 10. There are 10 different sections to this proposal. So I'll just talk about three. And then after I uh, speak about these three components, I'll tell you how I feel about it and what I think. So the first component here is called representation. And under that heading, the contract with Black America says that it wants affirmative action. And it, you know, so it wants all schools, public and private, to have proportionate blacks. Uh, they want the, the numbers of blacks to be proportionate in the school as it is uh, in the county in which the school is located. So we have affirmative action. Um, the second component of this proposal is lending reform. So here they want to change, it says they want to change the decades old credit scoring model to mandate consideration of consumer data on rent, utility, and cell phone bill payments. So just to you know, put this in my own words, what they want to do here is that they want to change the, um, the standards by which creditors screen out potential customers. So, you know, they, they want to essentially make it, you know, riskier for creditors to, um, to lend out, to sort of, you know, write loans to customers, right? Because if you're changing the standards here that they're using, that they traditionally use um, to try to find people who are trustworthy, if you're changing those standards, you know, you're, you're actually making it riskier for the businesses that use those standards, right? So, so that's the second one. And the third thing I want to bring up from the proposal is called police reform. And now we've heard about this a lot over the summer, but they say here on their site, um, it says here budget reallocation. So in what, and what has been referred to as defunding the police, 20% of 2020 budgets, then going forward adjusted to inflation, to be dedicated to improving conditions in lower class and black neighborhoods. Um, so I'll just stop there. So to put this in my own words, what they plan on doing, if they had their way, is to take 20% of the funds of the budget and allocate those to improving conditions in the community. Now, I'm not sure how this would work. I don't even quite know what it means. Um, would that 20%, you know, would, would police officers and people who are already in the department be the ones to try to improve the conditions in these neighborhoods? Or would you have a separate division, like a separate, a, a separate, you know, committee who would do this? Uh, that's unclear from the contract. And it's also unclear what it is they would be doing. I mean, what does it even mean to improve, improve the conditions of the neighborhood? Is this a beautification project? Are, are they going to plant petunias or or paint rainbows on buildings, or <laughs> I mean, I have no idea what's going on, and no one does either because they don't specify. So, anyway, those are the three things. So, affirmative action. They want to change the standards uh, that creditors use to make getting loans easier for the consumer, and they also want to 
reduce the budget of, of police departments and direct those funds into uh, into ways of improving the, the, the neighborhood. So what do I think about this? So I think the contract with Black America will be a complete, utter, and unmitigated failure. Uh, this is really bad, and it's hard to believe anyone can take this seriously. So let me give you two reasons why I think this will fail. The first reason is that it ignores the real reason of Black underachievement. And the second reason is that it, it believes that transferring benefits from one group to another will also transfer the virtues uh, or the, the disciplines and the skills needed to create those benefits. You know, so just because you transfer benefits, it doesn't mean you're transferring the skills and the virtues needed to create those benefits. And that's a major flaw in this proposal. So let me go back to the first one and give you some examples of why I think that it ignores the real reason of black underachievement. Well, first off, let me just tell you what that is. The real reason of black underachievement is, well, if we're talking about economic achievement or economic underachievement, it's that blacks don't have the necessary skills and knowledge to demand a high wage in the workforce. And it's that simple. Um, you know, if, if you have the skills and what some, it's, sometimes it's, it's referred to as human capital. So if you have the human capital, which includes you know, skills, knowledge, discipline, uh, all of these things, then you can demand a higher wage in a very competitive labor market. Um, and if you don't have that, then you can't compete with others who do. So that's the fundamental reason for black economic underachievement. And But let me give you some, some examples here from the three different components, the three, the three policy proposals that I, that I mentioned earlier. So if we look at affirmative action, what this is, it's putting people, it's putting minorities, in this case, let's say black students, into elite colleges. So that's into elite academic environments where they can't compete. Um, and they can't compete because their academic credentials aren't, aren't high enough. And that's the whole reason why you have affirmative action in the first place. It's to put them into institutions that they couldn't normally enter on their own because their, their academic background wasn't, wasn't competitive enough. So if you put students into environments where they're not competitive, it's harder for them. They fall behind, they drop out, they have no free time on the weekends because they're behind on their schoolwork. So not only does this encourage and, and um, promote bad grades, but it also promotes self-esteem issues, um, self-doubt. It's very bad both psychologically and academically. So that's a problem. The way to fix this would be to give them the skills before they got to college. That's how you fix this issue. Um, you have to look at the real reason why blacks are not competitive in the academic marketplace. And we're talking now for, for elite institutions. Um, and the reason is simple. The reason is that they, they're not competitive. They don't have a competitive academic background. So that needs to be fixed. First, you can't just fix, you can't just throw them in to these competitive environments without, without preparing them. Um, it's not only foolish, but it's cruel. So, and maybe I'll go with another one. Maybe I'll talk about um, defunding the police. So this is another policy that ignores the real reason for, um, in this case, for it could be incarceration rates. Um, it could be run-ins with the police. The real reason isn't because 
um, police are funded. <laughs> the, the reason is, is that blacks in these communities are committing astronomical levels of violent crime, especially with the gang activity. And I think everyone knows that there's a very high rate of black on black crime, uh, especially violent crime. So blacks are killing each other at an astounding rate and uh, reducing the funds of a police force isn't going to help that whatsoever. In fact, it's only going to exacerbate it because if you have fewer police uh, out in the streets, then you'll have fewer, you know, you'll have fewer people who are catching the bad guys. Um, and also, if you have a reduced budget, then the police that you do have on the force uh, will receive less training. And so you, you, you're actually making this situation much worse. And once again, this doesn't fix the problem. The root of the issue is understanding the violence and why, um, you know, why these mostly young men are killing each other. I mean, that needs to be addressed. The gangs they form and the violence and the carnage that they commit, um, that, that's the heart of the issue and that's what's being ignored. So the second point is that this contract believes that transferring benefits from one group also transfers the virtues and the disciplines and the skills that are needed to create those benefits. You know, um, and so like, I'll just give you an example. I mean, if you give someone a spot in, in an elite university, but they don't have the underlying structure to make the most of it, that's foolish. You can't assume just because you give someone a spot in a highly competitive um, environment, that solves the problem, that they're gonna have the skills, the highly competitive skills to make it in that environment. It doesn't work that way. Likewise, if you reduce your standards for lending credit and you just give someone money or give them a credit card or give them a home that they can't afford, if they don't have the disciplines and that underlying structure and that earning potential, and if they're not making wise decisions, they're, they're going to, you're going to put them in a worse position. They're not going to be able to pay back the loans or they're not going to be able to pay it on time. So just by giving something to someone, it, you're, you're not doing them a long-term service. You're, you're, you're really not because the person needs to be able to, um, you know, they need to be able to sort of properly appreciate what you're giving them. And they also have to have this underlying structure, for lack of a better term, to, to care for what they've gotten, to be a good steward of the benefit they've received, and hopefully to, to improve from it. So anyway, those are the reasons why I think a contract with Black America is a horrible idea. And it's really shocking if you, after you read this, it's a bit, it's a bit long, but after you read this entire thing, it's hard to believe anyone would A, take it seriously, and B, have the, have the gall to actually promote this on TV. So, Ice Cube, shame on you.